Uh, welcome to um, this session, um, the last one before lunch, I assume. Um, it's 11 a.m. I've learned in the U.S. on the East Coast. We have 4 p.m. here in, in Sweden. Uh, my name is Patrick Jung, and I'm with uh, Linköping University here in Sweden. Uh, this session uh, we have um, for, uh, on the topic of visualization. Uh, we have five presentations in this session, and I will... Um, uh, introduce you to the first speaker, which is uh, Matt Whitlock from the University of Colorado. Uh, he will present their work on graphical perception for immersive analytics. With this work, we explore different aspects of visualization design and how we effectively visualize data in AR and VR. In information visualization, graphical perception gets at how well a visualization represents the data to the user. And this can be done through a number of visual channels, such as color, size, and height, that represent the columns of your data. And there's been a lot of research in graphical perception on 2D displays, perhaps most notably by Cleveland and McGill, to establish how well different visual channels depict data to the user. With their work, they conducted an empirical study looking to rank these different visual channels for how accurately they represented data to the user. And this is important because when done well, information visualizations can help people toward understanding the data and drawing conclusions. These are a couple examples of relevant visualizations that paint a fairly clear picture of the delegate counts for the Democratic primaries on the left and the spread of the coronavirus on the right. On the flip side, if you make strange choices like truncating your axes to not start at zero, or if you use unintuitive color scales in your visualization design, you could actually wind up deceiving your viewers. And everything we know about how people accurately read visualizations is grounded in 2D. We don't know how well these ideas hold in virtual and augmented reality. So we look at how this issue of graphical perception changes as we move from standard 2D displays to VR and AR. So to tackle this issue of graphical perception in immersive analytics, I'll discuss the motivation, execution, and results of a visualization study that we ran. First, getting into the motivation. Prior research on immersive analytics has identified benefits to using AR and VR for data visualization. These include, but aren't limited to, sense making across tables, use of spatiotemporal data, and use of high dimensional data. However, there are some instances where we can deceive viewers just by using 3D in our visualizations. For example, the purple region looks a lot larger than the red one, and the green region looks much larger than the blue one when this pie chart is projected in 3D. But in fact, those aren't the conclusions you should be drawing based on the underlying data. And in a lot of cases, the use of 3D gives certain data points more screen space and can even wind up hiding data points. So while some people are encouraged by the use of AR and VR for 3D data visualization, Others are turned off to the notion altogether, as 3D data visualizations have a history of being poorly designed. So toward trying to reconcile that 3D visualizations have been so ineffective in the past, with findings that using AR and VR can help, we ran an empirical study to figure out what good visualization design looks like in immersive AR and VR. And in doing that, we consider three goals for designing visualizations. For users to get the right answer, to read the visualization quickly, and to be engaged with the data. And again, while this has been studied quite a bit for 2D displays, relatively little work has explored graphical perception in immersive AR and VR displays. So with our work, we wanted to see how does the perception of data visualizations change as we consider immersive AR and VR displays. And quickly revisiting Cleveland and McGill's work on graphical perception, we took a similar approach of exploring visual channels, considering five of the channels that they studied position, length, direction, volume, and color, and how effective they are in immersive environments. We ran a three by eight by three by two mixed factors study with display type distributed between our 42 participants and all other factors within participants. Our aim was to get at these differences in visualization perception for different immersive displays, considering several visualization designs and tasks. So first we looked at three different display types. The desktop condition allowed participants to look at visualizations on a 2D monitor. In the VR condition, we used an HTC Vive, and the AR condition also used the HTC Vive with an attached Z Mini for pass-through AR. The user interface for selection in AR and VR was to use a gaze ray-casted cursor, much like the HoloLens, for specifying an object, 
and the trigger on the back of the remote for selection. The desktop interface uses standard interactions from 3D modeling for panning and rotating the viewpoint and selecting points with the mouse. So since interaction standards are different for AR and VR displays than for desktop displays, we rely on previous literature that a gaze-based selection interface provides at least a reasonably comparable performance to a mouse interface when we design for selection on the Vive. We also consider different visualization designs. And as I talked about before, we explored five different visual channels, which are ways of representing data columns. So we showed participants a number of different visualizations that have X, Y, and a third dimension in this case encoded with color, or with a Z dimension and a fourth dimension for color. Other visualizations use size to encode data, some use orientation of lines, and we also tested bar charts that use height to encode data, and scatter plots that use depth where the further along the z-axis, the greater the value. So these are the visualization types that we used in our study, and to avoid confusion, I'll draw attention to the fact that when I discuss 3D visualizations, those are the x, y, and third dimension, whereas 4D visualization use x, y, z, and a fourth dimension. Participants engage with three different tasks. In an extrema task, participants look for the highest or lowest individual data point. Quadrant means tasks ask participants to identify the largest or smallest average area in a visualization. And trend tasks ask participants to identify the overall trend in the data. And for symmetry, half of the tasks ask for the highest value, highest area, or increasing trend, while half asked for the lowest value, area, or decreasing trend. So with display type distributed between participants and all other variables within participants, participants saw a total of 48 trials in the study. Here's a quick snippet of what participants saw in the AR condition. So participants would see a text describing the channel, dimensionality, and task for the next trial, and then the visualization loads in the room. Participants can navigate around the room before selecting and confirming their answer. Selecting no for a mistaken selection allows participants to return to the visualization to select the intended point of region, and selecting yes automatically loads the next trial. Participants in the desktop condition had the same tasks with the only difference being in the navigation interface. So as with the AR and VR conditions, Participants can navigate to different perspectives around the visualization before confirming their selection. We took several measures, both objective and subjective. We were primarily interested in error and time to completion for each trial, but we were also interested in how much participants navigated the environment, measured as the positional and rotational displacement of the camera game object at each frame. In between each block, we collected measures on how much participants preferred each visualization type through Likert scale questions. And after all three blocks, there was a final questionnaire with more Likert scale questions and open feedback. So with this study, we had four hypotheses that we wanted to test. First, we anticipated that participants would be able to identify differences in size for all displays, but that when asked to disentangle size and depth in the same visualization, participants in the desktop condition would struggle. We anticipated that stereo viewing in AR and VR should help participants identify whether a point renders small because the size of the point is small or because that point is far away. We also anticipated that participants on the desktop and in VR would be able to distinguish differences in color reasonably well, but that participants in AR would struggle identifying those color differences against a non-constant backdrop. Third, we expected the effectiveness of the navigation interface would correlate to performance with depth, height, and 4D visualizations, which all require some amount of navigation. And lastly, we expect a subjective preference toward embodied navigation over the mouse and keyboard. We have a more complete report of the results in our paper, but for this talk, I'll just focus on the hypotheses and key findings. 
So generally we wanted to see if there were differences in our measures across displays, and we did find there to be significant ones. Revisiting our original hypotheses, we first thought that participants would have difficulty disentangling depth and size on the desktop. And we saw strong evidence in support of this, that participants struggled with 4D size visualizations on the desktop, but that accuracy wasn't really compromised with depth visualizations. Subjective feedback pointed to the fact that participants on the desktop were able to navigate to a perspective on the side of the visualization to identify differences in depth. However, participants clearly had difficulty when asked to disentangle size from depth in 4D size visualizations on the desktop. Stereo viewing in AR and VR resolves this issue, allowing participants to infer depth without necessarily rotating the viewpoint. Second, we thought that color-based visualizations would be challenging in AR, and we found that to be the case as well. We found that participants were typically less accurate and slower in AR than on the desktop and for VR. And we anticipate that this was likely due to the non-constant background, as participants specifically called out that color in AR was particularly difficult due to the interference from the background color of the room. And here's an example of this using color in AR and what it would look like in VR or on the desktop. And you can clearly see the interference from the background of the room. And this not only has implications for use of color in AR, but also begs the question of whether use of skyboxes in immersive visualization impacts performance. So here you can see visualizations as the participants saw them in VR, and how they would have looked with default skybox and lighting conditions in Unity. For color visualizations in particular, in the bottom left you can see that the skybox makes it almost impossible to distinguish differences in color, because the white and blue backdrop makes points appear darker than they actually are. You can also see on the bottom right that white data points can get washed out entirely. We anticipated that success with the navigation system would correlate to performance for depth, height, and 4D visualizations. We saw some evidence toward this, as despite comparable accuracy, participants were slower in the desktop condition for 3D visualizations that require navigation. Accuracy didn't seem to be compromised, as there's generally a good perspective when assessing height and depth, but it just took longer for participants to navigate there. We saw only a little evidence toward preference to the embodied navigation, with participants reporting higher scores for the intuitiveness of inferring depth in AR and VR than on the desktop, despite no significant difference in ease of navigation. In open feedback, participants described walking into the graphs and being able to point with their fingers as being helpful techniques for VR and AR navigation. And most participants responded positively to the desktop navigation interface, though there were some that pointed out tasks that were particularly challenging with the mouse and keyboard interface. I touched on differences in navigation across displays, but one thing that was not a part of our hypotheses, but was immediately apparent, was that people navigated much more in AR than in VR. Here we normalized for time to completion, as we didn't want to confound large amount of navigation with high time to completion, and we found that participants moved around and looked around much more in AR, perhaps indicating greater comfort and more willingness to engage with visualizations when in augmented reality. So a couple additional pieces that we touched on with our study but that would benefit from future work. We could consider a number of color ramps that use different start and end colors, as well as diverging ramps that go through a neutral color. Additionally, we only tested in one room, and considering that participants perform poorly with color in AR specifically, it's worth considering the target environment when designing color visualizations in augmented reality. We would also like to further explore the effect of display type on navigation strategy as we focus mostly on amount of navigation with this study. Understanding how participants like to move around in different environments could impact how we should design visualizations depending on the display type. So with further study, we may find that different display types are better suited to different visualization types. Based on the finding that people are more willing to navigate in AR than in VR, we might find that higher dimensional data is better displayed in VR, whereas AR displays may be better suited to smaller situated visualizations. With our empirical study of how visualization perception changes for different display types and dimensionalities, we've identified key differences that should inform future immersive visualization design. Most notably, we found that color perception was worse in AR than in other conditions, that differences in size were difficult to disentangle from differences in depth on desktop displays, and that participants were more comfortable navigating in AR than in VR or on the desktop. 
So with that, I'll thank you for your time and take questions. Uh, so, thank you very much for, for a nice presentation, Matt. Um, we will see if we have any questions here over in Slido. And I believe I see one question up here um, from an anonymous here. Um, where uh, Were the participants somehow instructed to walk in VR, AR, or did you provide any training in that respect before conducting the experiment? Hmm. Yes. So. Um... We did provide training before each block. So we blocked it by task. You know, we had the, the quadrant tasks, the extreme tasks, and the trend tasks. And before each of those blocks, participants went through um, eight training trials, one for each visualization type that they were about to see two of. Um, and in those trials, uh, or in the, the training sets, we made sure that there was some amount of need to navigate, you know, so that some of the some of the correct answers for the training were in the back of the visualization. So you had to sort of pan around or walk around. Um, and the training also didn't let you, we didn't let participants leave the training until they got all of them right. So, um, so most people kind of started off sort of static by the end of the, the very first training session, people were typically walking around and, and comfortable moving in the, in the uh, navigation interface. So. All right, thank you. Um, so let's see if Catherine could hint us on, uh, I you see the time is 22 minutes past, so I don't know if we need to move on to the next or if we can take some more questions. Uh, so I do have another question here. And how did you recruit the participant for the ex experiment? Um, uh, were any of the participant experts in visualization? Right. So. We recruited participants from the university, um, you know, through a number of different channels, departments. Um, you know, we reached out to like the communications department and you know, did the typical computer science, information science recruitment, all that kind of stuff. Um, we didn't specifically look for visualization experts. We looked for just sort of lay users. Um, we did ask in demographic questions about experience with like three D modeling software, with game engines, that sort of thing, with AR and VR to kind of get at that. Um, but the tasks for from a visualization standpoint were, were you know reasonably straightforward to the point where I think I think all participants pretty well understood right away what what they were supposed to do. So I don't think you know I, I, I don't think the recruiting experts in visualization would have changed anything as much as you know different background experience with with these headsets and display types that sort of thing. So, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, and um, yeah. thanks again for the uh, presentation. Uh, next up uh, is a paper on immersive process model exploration in virtual reality. And that's done, uh, presented by Andre Zenner. Um, he's with the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, DFKI. Hello everyone, my name is Andre Zenner and I am a PhD student at Saarland Informatics Campus and a researcher at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. First of all, I'd like to thank all my co-authors for all the work that they put into the realization of the following project, which I'm going to present in my talk in the next minutes, Introducing Immersive Process Model Exploration in Virtual Reality. The following talk is about immersive data exploration and the data type of business process models. Process models are formal representations of real-world processes typically used for the documentation and communication of real-world process knowledge. To communicate process knowledge, traditionally, 
2D graph visualizations of the underlying graph structure of the process models are used. Process models can be formalized, for example, in the format of event-driven process chains, short EPCs, which is a widely used format to represent real-world processes. EPCs are alternating sequences of event nodes that depict the process state and function nodes that depict process activities which typically have some effort or duration associated with them. The process flow can be split up into multiple branches or merged together using logical connector nodes such as AND, OR and XOR nodes representing decisions and dependencies within the process and additional information is typically attached to function platforms for example, represented as organizational units, input, output or references to other processes. The process flow is indicated using directed edges. Process model experts are used to the representation format of EPC graphs and understand a process just given their 2D visualization. However, there are also application domains where non-expert users need to learn and understand complex process models, such as for example during professional training onboarding, education or in general in communication contexts. When using traditional 2D representations in these contexts, it is a non-optimal solution to just present a 2D graph structure as this requires some expert knowledge to understand the process, such as knowledge about the syntax and semantics of the process, and complex process graphs can become large and confusing. Just learning the 2D structure by heart, moreover, is an entirely passive, boring and not very motivating user experience. So the goal of this project was to come up with a novel interface that is suitable for non-expert users, that provides effective knowledge transfer, creates a motivating and interesting user experience and is also independent of the actual process domain. Previous work on immersive data analysis has considered how graphs can be explored in virtual reality focusing on the use case of an expert user sitting in a desktop environment and using a head-mounted display for the visualization of the graph structure. Moreover, also large-scale setups have been explored in work based on projection systems such as for example caves. The idea in our project was to combine both the idea of large-scale setups and the visualization using head-mounted displays and to use the large-scale setups to implement a passive haptic experience for the user as he explores the abstract data in virtual reality. And this leads me to the implementation of our system. The concept of our system is to provide an interactive and multi-sensory virtual reality journey that leads the user through the process graph. Users will travel from process start to the end of the process and carry information packages along the way. They will perform interactions that are aligned with the real-world process activities and they will experience the decisions and dependencies within the graph by interacting and interactively controlling the process flow at logical connector nodes. To implement this concept, our system is based on three components, the first of which is the 2D to 3D mapping. The 2D to 3D mapping is responsible for the immersive virtual reality visualization of the graph and first reads in the 2D graph structure from a standard file format. It then applies a 2D to 3D mapping that translates the 2D graph into an immersive virtual reality environment. The immersive environment resembles the graph in 3D as a structure made out of floating platforms. The important node types such as function and connector nodes are represented by room scale walkable platforms that carry interactive sockets the user needs to interact with as he walks through the process in virtual reality. Other node types are represented by their own 3D objects or floating platforms. You can see an example in the following video clip showing a simple example 2D EPC on the left and the corresponding immersive virtual environment on the right with two room scale walkable platforms, one green function platform and one logical connector platform in gray. And this leads me to the second main component which is the logical walkthrough. This component motivates the exploration of the graph and provides guidance as the user walks through the virtual environment. It also enforces a logical exploration order which is implemented using a basic gamification mechanism known as the unlocking mechanism. 
At the very beginning of the exploration, the user is located at the root node of the graph, which is the only unlocked node. The user will need to unlock the graph node by node, and in order to unlock a node, he has to transport an information package to the respective node. When arriving at a function node, the user has to take five interactions to proceed. First, he needs to pick up the information package at the input socket and carry it to a so-called function machine that is located at the center of each function platform. The function machine will start processing the information, which will take some time, and which is to highlight that a function actually represents a real-world activity that also needs some time. While waiting for the function machine to finish, the user can read more information about the real-world activity on the textual signs. As soon as the information is processed, the user can again pick it up and carry it to the output socket of the current platform, sending it away over the tube system to the following node, which unlocks the following platform. You can see the interaction in the following video, showing a user picking up an information package, dropping it into the function machine and taking it out again to send it off to the following node in order to unlock it. To enhance immersion even further and to provide a multisensory experience as the user passes through the process, we implemented auditory cues and active vibrotactile haptics in the first condition, which allows the user to explore the graph using a standard virtual reality controller. To enhance immersion even further, we then also integrated passive haptic feedback into the experience. To realize passive haptics, we developed three types of props. First, the mesh ball prop that represents the information package, which is a toy ball with a contained vibe tracker that provides tangibility to the information that the user needs to carry along the process. And second, two different types of interaction props that are located in the physical tracking space. You can see the symmetrical setup of the physical tracking space on the right hand side here which contains a funnel prop at each end of the tracking space that allows the user to drop an information package into an outgoing tube. The function machine prop in the center of the tracking space allows the user to drop an information package into the function machine and to later take it out again after the function machine finished processing the information. The physical props were spatially registered then to the different interactive modules on the function platform and on the logical connector platform. The following video showcases how the user interacts in this physical passive haptic environment. The user can tangibly grab the information package, drop it into a function machine, take it out again and finally also drop it into an outgoing tube to send it away to the following platform. In order to reuse the physical props in the physical space, we implemented a custom 180 degree resetting controller that rotates the user's view during certain teleportations. This controller would effectively mirror the real to virtual spatial registration and compresses arbitrarily large EPC processes into a limited physical space that only contains four different physical props. And this leads me to the evaluation of our system. We conducted a user study to assess how well our virtual reality interface can convey a process that is unknown to the user. For this, we turned to related literature on process model understandability and took a test process that depicts the process of delivering goods to a store in 53 nodes. Our study was designed as a between subjects experiment comparing three different conditions with 27 participants. Our baseline condition was the 2D exploration interface implemented on an Apple iPad using the visualization of the B-Flow Star toolbox and our experimental conditions were the virtual reality conditions using our immersive exploration interface, once with virtual reality controllers and once with passive haptic feedback. Each participant was assigned to one of the conditions in the study and after filling out a consent form and reading through an introduction, they could practice learning an EPC with their respective method in a short tutorial. After completing the tutorial, each participant performed the actual task of the process, which was to learn and understand the complete test process given to them and to indicate to the experimenter as soon as they have understood the process. The experimenter then stopped the experiment as soon as this was indicated, stopped taking the time 
and a set of questionnaires was answered and filled in by the participant. The complete study took around 90 minutes per participant. When we look at the results of our study, we can confirm our first hypothesis, which was expecting that virtual reality exploration takes more time than 2D exploration. The results for objective efficiency show that users can learn the test EPC much faster on a 2D interface with an iPad than they can learn it with virtual reality exploration, no matter whether they use virtual reality controllers or passive haptic feedback. When we look at the results of our second hypothesis, however, we cannot confirm it, as it expected the learning results with virtual reality to be better than with 2D interfaces. Our results for objective effectiveness, which was measured using the performance of 12 understandability checkbox questions, did not show a significant effect across the conditions. Finally, our third hypothesis can again be confirmed, which was expecting that virtual reality exploration offers a better user experience than the 2D exploration. This was indicated by the user experience questionnaire results, more specifically the hedonic UEQ novelty subscale that measures user interest. Here we can see that interfaces using virtual reality and passive haptic feedback deliver a significantly better user experience than using a 2D standard interface on an Apple iPad. To summarize our main study results, we found a central trade-off between efficiency and user interest. When it comes to recommendations and to an application where a non-expert user needs to learn about a process that is unknown to him, then we recommend to use a 2D standard exploration interface if time efficiency is more important than user interest. If however in other application domains such as for example during education or communication contexts, user interest is more important than the time efficiency, we recommend to use an immersive virtual reality interface such as the one we presented, preferably also supported by passive haptic feedback. And finally, I'd like to present to you some ideas for future work. In future research, we like to investigate how we can better adapt the visualization and the interactions in the experience to the actual real-world process domain in order to make the virtual reality interaction less repetitive and abstract. Moreover, we are also interested in looking into solutions that allow multi-user collaboration inside the virtual reality exploration experience. Future work should also study and compare the short-term and long-term learning effects of the different conditions to see if an experienced-focused virtual reality interface provides any benefits in terms of memorability. And finally, by extending our system with standard editor functionality, for example to create different parts of a process while being in VR, our system could be extended to a virtual reality process modeling tool. And with this I'd like to conclude my talk, so thank you very much for the interest and I'm now very happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Andre, for um, that presentation. Um, a very interesting um, topic. Uh, we do have uh, one question so far in the Slido, and so I would recommend everybody listening here to um, go over to the Slido uh, to uh, post any more questions here. Uh, do you try to compare the God mode and first person view? Hmm. That's, a, that's a very interesting idea. Um, so as you saw from the slides and the talk, we did not compare the God modes, um, like external view of the graph while being in VR in this study. Um, instead, we compared the um, traditional way of exploring such a graph on a 2D interface to an immersive way that is um, more first person view. However, for future work, I think that would be an interesting um, idea because also from the comments of our participants, we got that 
One disadvantage of using such an immersive interface as we build it is that it's hard to just take a quick look at some parts of the process because you kind of have to travel there first to really see the details of the, for example, the end of the process. So that um, is certainly a disadvantage over having an overview. Um, and we thought about maybe implementing something like a minimap feature, which would be something like a God mode here um, that allows the user to zoom out of the process while being in VR and getting an overview over the complete process. Uh, so I guess that would be a cool uh, future future study to compare this, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, had a, maybe a slightly um, other question here. Um, if you're looking at the process description, is there any way to express uh, different levels of cognitive engagement in the interactions? Um, you mean that when a, for example, an activity in a process is cognitively, cognitively demanding to have a different interaction implemented, that, that's a yeah. very cool idea. So the problem that we had at the beginning um, was that it's kind of standardized how the um, graph is structured and what kind of types of nodes exist. And the function nodes being very central to this represent real world activities, but it's kind of unstructured um, with what these function nodes are actually um, like enriched with, with which kind of data. So sometimes it's data about the temporal um, aspect of the activity, like how much time it will take to complete the activity. Sometimes it might be um, annotated with some data about the cognitive demand. Sometimes it's annotated with something completely different. So in our system, we try to stay kind of abstract and support most of, most of the data. And in the study, then we did not implement any specific type of annotated data. So we didn't include it in our system here. But I think um, if you know that all the graphs you will explore will always have some cognitive data annotated, then I think that would be a really, really cool option. And maybe you could provide kind of um, props that allow then for, for different kind of interactions that are more involved. So the prop interactions that we build in here are kind of simple. Um, thank you very much um, for that um, uh, interesting answer um, to that question. Um, I would like to, to say to the viewers here that you can um, probably find the authors and presenters here uh, on the Slack channel for, um, for the questions. And um, then you can also visit the Hubs room. Uh, and I was uh, told the Andrea will be available in the DC posters one to four. Um, afterwards uh, in the session. Uh, so I think we can conclude um, the second talk here and we launch over to the third presentation here uh, on real and virtual environment mismatching induces arousal and alters movement behavior. Uh, the presenter is from Purdue University and it's Christos Mosas. Thanks. Hello everyone, and thank you for attending my virtual presentation. I'm Christos Musas from Purdue University, and I will present you my research entitled Real and Virtual Environment Mismatching Induces Arousal and Dallas Movement Behavior. Experiencing a virtual environment while being in a constrained real environment might be problematic. Moving within that real environment while wearing a head mount display may alter the psychological state of participants due to the mistrust of the real environment. In general, constrained real environments provide different challenges compared to virtual reality lab spaces. For example, in home or office virtual reality setups, the furniture constrains the walkable area, whereas virtual reality labs are typically large empty rooms. Despite the fact that a number of mapping ethic techniques have attempted to solve the mismatching problem, further experimentation is required in order to assess how deviations between virtual and real world may affect the psychology and movement behavior of participants. It has been found that the conflict between the provided visual stimuli of the virtual environment and the participants' knowledge of the real environment in which they are situated affect their navigational choices. However, even though we do know that aesthetically mismatched real and virtual environments alter movement behavior in virtual reality users, less attention has been given to the user's psychological state. Therefore, more input is required on the exact type of mismatches which are responsible for affecting mental and physical behavior. Understanding the way alterations occur in arousal 
and move behavior when interacting within such environments can yield several beneficial applications which can prove useful for virtual real developers. This paper investigates whether and what type of mismatches between a real and virtual environment might affect the electrothermal activity and movement behavior of virtual reality users. As a task, participants were asked to walk around the environment by simply following a provided path. Based on the collected data, this study aims at answering the following four research questions. Are there differences in the electrothermal activity of participants across the five experimental conditions? Are there differences in the movement behavior of participants across the five experimental conditions? Are there differences in participants' behavior when interacting with completely mismatched environments compared to partially mismatched environments or identical environments? Does arousal correlate with the movement behavior of participants when working with mismatched real and virtual environments? For this study, 100 health individuals were recruited from a university setting. The participants were recruited through posters placed on notice boards across campus, class announcements and emails. All participants were volunteers and there was no type of compensation involved. Of the sample size, 31 were female and 69 were male. 38 had no prior experience with virtual reality. Moreover, none of the participants experienced motion sickness during the experiment. Note that participants were provided written consent as dictated by the ARB of our university. This study was performed at the motion cap studio of our department. The dimensions of the studio are 8 meters long. 8 meters wide with a sailing height of 4 meters. These dimensions were used to approximate the design of the virtual environment used in the study. We removed all furniture from the lab to be as empty as possible. For the purpose of this experiment, two different environments were designed. The first one was a replica of the motion cap studio that was used as our baseline environment. The second one was an imaginary environment that was designed to let us investigate the alterations of human electrothermal activity and movement behavior. We developed five experimental conditions to help us understand how and if participants' prior knowledge of special constraints in the real environment could alter their arousal and movement behavior when they were immersed in a virtual environment. The developed conditions were the following. The first condition is called matched appearance and no constraints. This is our baseline condition. The virtual environment in this condition is a replica of the real environment in which the experiment was conducted. This baseline condition was used in order to capture the way that participants move and respond in a constrained environment condition. No obstacles were in either the real or virtual environments during this condition. The second condition is called mismatched appearance and no constraints. This condition presents an imaginary environment that matches the special constraints of the virtual environment. No obstacles were in either the real or virtual environments during this condition. The third condition is called mismatch appearance with constraints. This condition uses the imaginary environment and there is a mismatching of the appearance between the real and the virtual environments. Special constraints were added in the real environment by placing obstacles such as carton boxes and the notice board. Obstacles do not show in the virtual environment. However, note that participants were aware of the obstacles as the obstacles were placed there before the start of the experiment. The fourth condition is called mismatch appearance and match constraints. This condition used the imaginary environment and the obstacles in the real environment are substituted with the virtual objects in the virtual environment. Note that the size of the objects in the virtual environment match the size of the obstacles in the real environment. Moreover, as the mismatch appearance with constraints condition, the participants of this condition were also aware of the obstacles placed in the real environment. The last condition is called mismatch appearance and mismatch constraints. This condition used the imaginary environment and there is mismatching of both the appearance and the special constraints between the real and the virtual environments. The special constraints mismatching was achieved by placing obstacles in the real environment. Specifically, the position of obstacles in the virtual environment do not match the position of obstacles in the real environment. Note that participants were aware of the position of the real obstacles as the obstacles were placed in the real environment before the start of the experiment. The devices used for this study were the MSI VR1 backpack computer for running the virtual reality application, the HTC Vive Pro head mount display for projecting the virtual reality content, the XS motion capture system for transferring the motion of participants with the virtual environment and for capturing their motion, and finally the Simmer 3 GSR Plus on electrothermal activity sensor was used for capturing the physiological responses of participants. The application used for the study was developed in the Unity 3D game engine version 2019.1.4. In this study, regardless of the condition our participants exposed, all of them were asked to follow the exact same path. 
note that the total distance participants had to cover was 150 meters. The rationale for choosing such a long walk was based on our assumption that even though participants were aware of special constraints in the real environment, after walking through various positions within the virtual environment, they would expectedly become unaware of their special position with respect to the obstacles. This sense of disorientation is what we want to induce to our participants during the study to investigate possible derations in their arousal and movement behavior. The path course would appear progressively on the ground in the form of a rendered line that the participant would follow. We decided to have a line displayed on the ground. Our intention was to examine how closely participants would adhere or how far they would deviate from the specified course. In designing the predefined path, we considered the proxemics model. The minimum distance between the points of the path and obstacles or walls was set as a distance of 23 cm. Note that the diameter of the far face of the intimate space is 46 cm. Based on this, we made sure that all participants had enough clearance to move relatively comfortably within the virtual space. Electrodermal activity and movement behavior data were collected to investigate possible variations in the participants' behavior during the experiment. To record the electrodermal activity, we identified and calculated the number of peaks and their average amplitude throughout the experiment. These procedures enable us to examine both the frequency and the intensity of physiological arousal in the participants. A motion capture system was used to record the movement behavior of participants under the assigned experimental conditions. Our goal was to get both global and local input on how participants walked within the virtual environment. To obtain global input, we captured the average speed of the participants and the average deviation from the provided path. These measurements provide special important information about the participants' movement behavior. To obtain local input, we computed step length and step duration. A one-way analysis of variance was used to analyze the data using the five conditions as a dependent variable and the collected data as dependent variable. No significant results were found with respect to the number of peaks. However, we did find significant results in the participants' amplitude of peaks across the five experimental conditions. Pairwise comparisons show that the mean amplitude of peaks during the mismatch appearance and no constraints condition was significantly lower than that for the mismatch appearance with constraints condition and the mismatch appearance and the mismatch constraints condition. Moreover, the mean amplitude of peaks during the mismatch appearance and no constraints condition was significantly lower than that for the mismatch appearance with constraints condition and the mismatch appearance and the mismatch constraints condition. Regarding the movement behavior feature that described the global motion of participants, we found a significant effect of participant speed across the five experimental conditions. Pairwise comparisons show that the mean score for the mismatch appearance and no constraints condition was significantly higher than that for the mismatch appearance with constraints condition the mismatch appearance and constraints condition, and the mismatch appearance and mismatch constraints condition. We also found a significant effect of the participants' deviation from the provided path across the five experimental conditions. Pairwise comparisons show that the mean score for the mismatch appearance with constraints condition was significantly lower than that for the mismatch appearance and no constraints condition, the mismatch appearance and no constraints condition, and the mismatch appearance and mismatch constraints condition. Moreover, the pairwise comparison shown that the mean score for the mismatch appearance and mismatch constraints condition was significantly lower than that for the mismatch appearance and no constraints condition, the mismatch appearance and no constraints condition, and the mismatch appearance and mismatch constraints condition. Regarding the movement behavior features that describe the local motion of participants, we also found a significant effect on the participant step leg across the five experimental conditions. Pairwise comparisons shown that the mean score for the mismatch appearance and no constraints condition was significantly higher than that for the mismatch appearance and no constraints condition, the mismatch appearance with constraints condition, the mismatch appearance and mismatch constraints condition, and the mismatch appearance and mismatch constraints condition. Finally, no significant results were found with respect to the step duration of the participant's motion. We also conduct correlation analysis to investigate possible correlations between electrodermal activity and movement behavior. The Pearson product moment correlation coefficient was used to screen the data. Based on the conduct correlation analysis, we were able to identify negative weak linear correlations between peak amplitude and step length, peak amplitude and deviation, and number of peaks and step length. The obtained results from the electrodermal activity measurements showed that there were alterations participants are also in the group that experienced the mismatch appearance with constraints and the mismatch appearance and mismatch constraints conditions. Our results indicate that regardless of whether participants were exposed to constraints or mismatch constraints situations, their prior knowledge of real-world obstacles exerts similar effects on participants' physiological responses.
The results from emotion feature measurements indicate that from a global point of view, participants tended to move slower in the virtual environment when obstacles were located within the real environment compared to the conditions in which no obstacles were present. From a local point of view, we found that when participants were placed in mismatched conditions, the step length decreased. It shows from a local point of view how participants tend to regulate the stepping motion. For us, it looks like participants did not feel safe enough to perform long steps but rather short ones in order to move to an area close to their current position. Finally, although only weak correlations were found, the results indicate that changes in the participants' movement correlate with electrodermal activity. Our findings indicate that when arousal increases, step length and deviation of the provided depth decrease. Besides the promising findings that our study has yielded, there are a few limitations that should be addressed. The first is related to the electrodermal activity. There is a chance that the significant effect that were found when examining the results of the electrodermal activity might be random instead of regular due to the unwanted noise captured during the walking task. The second limitation is related to the way participants were depicted within the virtual environment. It is assumed that additional experimentation in which participants are represented with a self-avatar might provide interesting, quite possibly varying results. A third limitation is that for the purpose of this experiment, we examined just five conditions, even though we could have added more. However, we decided to limit our study to the five conditions since in real life it is more common to have user experience in a virtual environment that is different from the real home environment in terms of appearance and constraints. The last limitation we wish to acknowledge is the omission of a questionnaire. It looks like additional self-reported emotion ratings are necessary to explore other emotional dimensions such as stress and confidence. Understanding the way a virtual reality participant's behavior changes when interacting with virtual environments which do not match the appearance and constraints of the real ones might help developers build virtual reality experience that can be considered more precise and thus more efficient. As a result, user engagement and immersion would also improve. In this project, we studied the impact that real and virtual environment mismatching had on participants' arousal and movement behavior. The obtained findings indicate that the mismatching between the real and virtual environments indeed affect the arousal and movement behavior for participants. However, this was more obvious when there were both appearance and constraints mismatching between the real and the virtual environments. Thank you for attending my virtual presentation. Uh, thank you very much, um, Christos, for, for a nice presentation. Um, we uh, do not have any questions here on the um, Slido uh, board as of now. Um, I was um, thinking you, you only had um, static objects and placed out and mismatched and match and so forth. Um, had you any considerations about having real characters or, or people or virtual characters in the same environment as well? Uh, no, we decided that the, it, it might be better for us to have just static objects. Uh, uh, in general, we are planning to do other studies that we are going to examine dynamic events in virtual environments. For example, being in a virtual environment which we have uh, a television or you know a, a light that is flickering. Uh, but at this point, we just wanted to explore uh, the arousal and movement behavior participants when uh, there is just aesthetic uh, and constraint mismatch between the real and virtual environments. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Um, what were the constraints used in the experiments? Um, constraints uh, in terms of uh, real constraints? <laughs> We used carton boxes and a notice board, and for the virtual constraints were simple objects, sci-fi objects we created. Mm -hmm. Were the uh, users aware of these? Uh, were they, were aware or... of the, they, they were aware of the real objects because they, they saw them once they visited mm -hmm. the, the lab space. They were not aware about the virtual environment, the experience, the environment once they, they wear the mask, the HMD. Okay. Uh, all right, um, I don't see that we have any more questions to ask. Um, so what's your um, next work you're gonna do for this? 
I don't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Okay. It, it's going to be an extension of this, and we're going to mm -hmm. uh, examine them more, uh, with uh, more data what is the reason that uh, the arousal of people changes in uh, when there's a mismatching between the real and virtual environment. We're trying to understand. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that says that, okay, the movement of participants changes when they walk in an environment different, in an uh, environment which is, that, you know, environments that are different between uh, real and virtual, but we don't know why this is happening. So we will work towards this direction. Okay. Um, thank you once again, Christos. Yeah, and um, thanks a lot. you will also be available in the Hump's Room uh, DC posters one yeah, through four. Yeah, maybe I will join uh, yeah. after the session. And we also have the Slack channel visualization, uh, session 20 visualization as well, uh, where you can post questions or so get in contact. Um, our next um, speaker is uh, Jean Philippe Stoffer. Um, Apologize if I didn't pronounce your last name there. Um, he's from uh, University of Wolfsburg in Germany. And uh, his talk is uh, called Simultaneous Runtime Measurement of Motion to Photon Latency and Latency Jitter. Okay, so welcome to my presentation for the paper Simultaneous Runtime Measurement of Motion to Photon Latency and Latency Jitter. I'm Jan Philipp Stauffert, and I would like to guide you through the content of the paper by dissecting that title. And I'd like to start with motion to photon latency. So many people already know that, but uh, let's look to the right here where I have um, a small demonstration. So motion to photon latency is the time it takes from moving something, for example, the controller here, and then this um, movement gets tracked, this new information gets fed into the simulation, this um, outcome there will get rendered and then on the screen the controller will move as well and obviously i have only those three parts here but there are many more and each one of those three parts already consists of multi multiple more and each of those parts contribute a bit of latency and the latency in total from the movement in reality and then until it takes to see the movement in the virtual part is the motion to photon latency. Now, why do we care about motion to photon latency? Well, first of all, it makes people sick. So cyber sickness is a well-known effect and um, latency is one part that contributes to cyber sickness. Meaning if the latency is too high, people will get sick, like um, this person here vomiting or just feeling a bit of uneasiness, nausea, disorientation. The other part is performance. So performance can degrade if motion to photon latency is too high. For example, this one guy here, he misses the virtual tennis ball because uh, he couldn't really judge how fast it will be. Now that we see that it's important to care about motion to photon latency because it has adverse um, effects. The question is how can we measure it so we at least know what to expect and if it's more or less good or if it's too high. Well, there are two approaches and well, there are a lot of approaches, but I would um, categorize them into two parts. One is where we have camera and that camera now records both the real and the virtual object. And we then look at the video and see 
what's the time difference between those two movements? Usually we look at either the beginning of a movement or some special movement in between, or the object follows a known movement, for example, a pendulum movement. Now, the other way to, motion, to measure motion to photon latency is a bit more involved, and it tries to separate those two parts. So one part is um, we have, let me, um, let me grab the sword properly. Um, so we have the real object and there we have something to measure it. And on the other side, in the real object, we have something um, to measure when it starts to move or how it moves. And then on the screen, now obviously that pen doesn't work anymore. Um, on the screen, we then have something that can detect when the virtual one moves. And um, on the screen, we usually have a photodiode attached and that photodiode then reads the encoded movement of the real object. And this second way to measure motion, motion to photon latency is the approach that we took here as well. And um, let's go over to the other side where I can show you our setup. So our setup looks as followed. We do have a wife tracker. We use an HTC wife and we use a microcontroller to then measure it. And the Wife tracker is mounted on a stepper motor. So we always know what the real movement of the stepper of the wife tracker is because we drive the stepper motor, we know the rotation step, and therefore we know the rotation and the orientation of that wife tracker. On the other side, we have the HTC wife, and there we encode the rotation of the tracker onto the image. And we see up here a schematic just of the screen. And there we see we have four photodiodes placed and each of those four photodiodes can measure four different brightness levels and we encode the rotation there. And then we feed this encoded orientation of the wife tracker to a microcontroller and uh, that microcontroller drives the stepper motor so here we now close the loop and the microcontroller now knows what's the base truth of the stepper motor and therefore of the wife tracker it can read the photodiodes so it knows what the system reports and then calculate what's the difference between the real motion and the reported motion. Um, and I have here written that obviously we are not the first ones to take an approach like have a tracked object rotating or on the other side put photodiodes on a screen um, there are multiple approaches that work like that, but what makes our approach unique is the selection of those different parts. And let's go back to the middle to see what we can measure with that setup. So a measurement run would look like that. Here we see the latency in the y-axis and the time in the x-axis. So we just had our set up running for a certain amount of time. And for every frame, we can now measure what's the latency between the real and the virtual. And most of our samples are around a mean here, more or less like uh, 55 milliseconds. But then we have some outliers, not that often, but every now and then. So this main, these main latencies here, they are around 99%, but 
but then we have those outliers. And if we look at the outliers, then we can see that there are some outliers that are completely random. We do not know what happens there. And then there are regular latency spikes. We again do not know what exactly happens, but we can assume that there are multiple different things happening in the background that affect how the tracking works. And together we can see that um, there's a lot going on. And usually we only measure this mean latency. But what we can see here now is that every now and then we do have a spike. And if we assume that latency does have negative influences on our experience, on our well-being, then those spikes can have massive impact. And this is the continuous part now in our title because in our setup over there to the left, we see that we can measure continuously because the rotator, uh, the tracker rotates continuously and we measure with the photo diets for every, um, for every frame that's rendered. Now, the interesting thing is um, the way we selected those parts is now that there is an extension to our setup. You can see our setup here in the middle. That is um, how we tested it. We had a wife that we dis disassembled and placed the photo dies like shown here. But the extension that we could now do is if we have our photo diets arranged like that, we do not necessarily need the whole screen, but we could move the photo diets to the sides. And then in the middle, in the main part of the screen, we could show a whole virtual reality application and only, um, and only have parts of that screen occupied, which means we could now, um, we could now have our virtual reality experience where we put on the wife headset we have the photo diets on the sides and we have the wife tracker over there somewhere in a corner of our room and we can now measure during a vr experiment now to conclude oh, ah no we still have more measurements, <laughs> which I forgot. Um, and those measurements here are what we measured with our setup. And what you can see here in the top is a normal run where we have our system being more or less idle. And that being more or less idle means we have most of our latencies around the mean. That's the one that we expect and we have only really few outliers here um, the axis here is exponential so those ones here are really just few we tested our setup then here in the second row with artificial latency spikes just to see if in the case that we introduce artificial latency do we does our setup pick those spikes up and what we can see here is we delay tracking information for one and two frames every now and then and we now have those two spikes and with the confidence that we get here from the knowledge that our system picks up latency spikes if we introduce them artificially we now measure in the bottom row our system which we stress in the background we run um, a benchmark that stresses the CPU and GPU. And what we can see here now is that our latencies are much more distributed. We have a lot more outliers. We have a lot more that are far above the mean. And this is what we would expect if our system runs at its limits. And that's what we usually have if we have a virtual reality experience and that virtual reality experience wants to wants to show us the maximum amount of details the maximum amount of 
things that we can do. So usually we try to exactly do that, but what we can see is if we get close to the limits of our system, then we have a lot of outliers. So to conclude, um, our contribution is that we propose the setup that we just saw. Our setup has the benefit of being able to measure latency for every frame. It's not um, certain events, but we can do that continuously. And we could even extend it to measure latency during a VR experience, which then becomes really important if we assume that there will be spikes and we just saw there will always be spikes. So it's not, it is not sufficient to measure latency once before and then say, well, everything is all right, more or less in the mean, but uh, we would need to measure during VR exposure to still have the confidence that um, latency behaves the way we expect it to be. And then um, last, we described what we found, what we measured with our setup, and uh, that we could really see all those outliers and how latency behaves in our case. And with that, I'd like to go over to the questions part. So let me just... Thank you very much, JP, for, for that uh, interesting uh, presentation um, of your work. Um, I have uh, one question here on Slido, so uh, users head over to Slido to add your uh, questions here. Um, have you validated the measurements against a different measuring method? Um, no, we did not. Um, we tried to validate as much of our setup. So we looked into a lot of things that can go wrong, but we did not validate it with another approach yet. Okay. Um, have um, another question here um, for myself. Uh, um, when um, <clears throat> when you notice these different things, did you also inspect and, and, and log, for instance, the timing measurements within the Unreal Engine or on the CPU side or to kind of see what's bothering the system or understand better? Um, no, we did not. Um, so it's... Um... <laughs> It's a good question. Um, the, the problem with motion to photon latency is that there are so many parts in between. And um, we're just beginning to understand what parts have what influence in there. So, um, um, so we did not really look into where, where could it come from. But um, right now, at that moment, we are um, at the point where we can say that there is something, um, we can measure it, and the next step would be then to try to dig deeper and see where it works, well, wh where it comes from. And um, so we do have some some ideas where things may, might come from. For example, um, in our case, we use the wife tracker and um, what we can see is that other approaches use um, the HMD itself or a controller to be the origin of movement. And 
we see that depending on what object you track, like if if it's a wife tracker or the HMD, um, there are a lot of algorithms that uh, try to optimize that. And we assume that our regular latency in this case might be an algorithm that usually tries to optimize the tracking there. Um, okay, thank you very much. And um, thank you. We should um, probably move over to the last talk in this session here, um, which is presented by uh, Madi, uh, Madi Abbaspur Terani. And this is an invited TVCG paper. And it's called Automated Geometric Registration for Multi-Proactor Displays on Arbitrary 3D Shapes Using Uncalibrated Devices. Hello, my name is Mahdi Abbaspur Tehrani from iGravi Lab. This work is with Professor Aditi Majumder and Professor Gopi Munich Susumra. My paper title is Automated Geometric Registration for Multi-Projector Displays on Arbitrary 3D Shapes Using Uncalibrated Devices. When illuminating a 3D surface of large size or curved shapes with projectors, more often than not, a single projector is not sufficient. For example, when creating a 360 degree around display on this way, multiple projectors have to be tied for coverage. When using multiple projectors, the goal is to create a shape-conforming display on the surface with accurate registration of content across multiple projectors. The latter is what we call geometric registration. Tied means two adjacent projectors are overlap minimally at the periphery to increase a spatial or angular coverage. The brighter region between adjacent projectors thus created during tiling is called the overlap region. Alternatively, Multiple projectors may also superimpose to increase brightness, as you see here. Accurate geometric registration and shape-conforming display is hugely challenging in this case, but we would like to treat these two cases under the same umbrella of a scalable solution. Our main contribution lies in a complete consistent recovery of all parameters of projectors and cameras, the shape of the illuminated 3D surface, and subsequent geometric registration in the multi-projector system using uncalibrated devices, without using any fiducia. Recovering 3D shape accurately in turn also enables shape conforming display on the surface. More importantly, unlike any prior method that need at least two cameras to observe every surface point, we can achieve this registration even when parts of the surface are observed by just single camera. Unlike any prior work, we can estimate the parameters for nonlinear projectors recovering their nonlinear distortion parameters, and their intrinsic and extrinsic parameters as well. Finally, we can handle both tiled and superimposed projection using the same method. The novelty of our technique lies in using multiple levels of cross validation across multiple devices and surface geometry to recover the numerous system parameters robustly. Let us now compare our method with prior works. Technically, geometric registration entails finding the set of pixels from other projectors overlapping with every pixel of a projector on the display surface. Geometric registration can be performed using an observing camera without the full-fledged estimation of system parameters and reconstruction of the 2D surface. When parameters are not estimated, partial recalibration of the system focusing on only the devices that changes is not possible. When surface geometry is not recovered, view-independent shape-conforming displays are not possible. Most pure work pr propose geometric registration and not full-fledged estimation of all system parameters. In our work, however, recovery of all system parameters provides geometric registration as a byproduct. Along with other superior capabilities of high accuracy, scalability, and robustness, partial recalibration, and shape-conforming registration. Most previous works so far have focused on one-time calibration, which is usually repeated every time anything changes in the system. Continuous calibration has been addressed so far only a smaller single projector system. There is a long list of prior work, and here is a comparison with our work. The important point to note in this table is no prior work can achieve all of these together. Projector calibration, handling arbitrary geometry, requiring only one camera per surface point, not needing any fiducials, scaling to any number of projectors, superimpose or tight projection, providing subpixels and providing subpixel accuracy. We propose the first method that achieve all of this together. 
Our system is made of a network of arbitrary number of computers, cameras, and projectors. We assume that we have an initial estimation of the focal length of the camera, which can be read from an image metadata. We do not have any restriction on the alignment of projectors or cameras like some previous works, where a rectangular grid of projectors are assumed. Our only assumption is that each surface point is seen by at least one camera and there are overlaps between devices. Therefore, our method will not work on a single projector. Our algorithm starts with the creating the connectivity graph between all devices. Then we do partial 2D reconstruction and camera calibration. After that, we locally calibrate projectors, and the last step is radially cascading surface integration. Let's start with the connectivity graph construction. For this purpose, first of all, we need a set of correspondences between cameras and projectors. We achieve this by projecting a set of binary beloved patterns. Note any structural light techniques can be used to achieve these correspondences. The goal of this step is to automatically find the overlap between devices. Each node of this graph denotes a project or a camera, and an edge between two nodes indicates an overlap between the, their field of view. The graph is made of two subgraphs, the camera adjacency graph and the projector adjacency graph, and cross edges between them showing overlap between projectors and cameras. Using projected patterns, first each camera creates its own local adjacency graph and also adjacency graph for each projector that it can see. Then they broadcast these subgraphs over the network to merge and construct the complete connectivity graph between all devices. Next step is the partial 3D reconstruction and camera calibration. Assume a system made of three projectors and three cameras. Here is the field of view of each camera and the constructed connectivity graph. First, for each projector, we select a camera connected to that projector with maximum degree in the connectivity graph. This camera will be the origin of the coordinate system. Now we use a structure from motion technique to reconstruct the geometry of the surface in the overlap of each pair of cameras connected to this projector and the reference camera. For example, here is the overlap of camera 1 and 2 and the overlap of camera 1 and 3. This gives us the partial, partial re reconstruction of the surface and the location and orientation of the cameras. Then we use bundle adjustment optimization to merge these 3D reconstructions and refine the parameters of the cameras to be consistent with each other. Next step is initial localized uh, projector calibration. From previous step, we got parameters of cameras and partial 3D surface SI for each projector in its local coordinate system. Now we use the correspondences between 3D coordinates of reconstructed points and their 2D location in projector's image plane to calibrate each individual projector and find all its parameters. Note that in this essay, we can not only recover the intrinsic parameters but also nonlinear distortion parameters as well. Please refer to the paper for more details. Then, as we mentioned earlier, we can use each projector as a dual of a camera to reconstruct the rest of the surface geometry in the field of view of each projector. Now we have the 3D geometry of surface projected by each projector, but these partial reconstructions are in different coordinate system and are still not consistent with each other. Finally, we came to the last step of the surface integration. The goal of this step is to bring all reconstruction in a global coordinate system. We achieve this by integrating the partial reconstruction surface one by one. But the question is, what should be the order of projectors to integrate into the larger reconstructed surface? For the best integration result, we start with the projector with maximum number of overlaps with other projectors, which means the projector with maximum degree in the connectivity graph. Then we choose the next projector by finding the one with maximum connectivity with already integrated projectors, and so on. At each step, we integrate the constructed surface of projector I by finding a rotation, translation, and a scale factor for the new projector. And then we refine the 3D coordinates of the points in the overlap area by minimizing the error between 3D coordinates of points in the overlap area. As a result, we get a consistent 3D geometry of the display surface and parameters of all devices. For more details of all these steps, please refer to the paper. Let's look at some results. Next, we perform a shape conforming registration, which enables wallpapering of content on the surface. For this purpose, we need to warp the projected image by each projector. This will give us a per pixel displacement map for each projector, which can be used in GPU to warp the projected image in a real time. Here you can see the result of shape conforming geometric registration before and after calibration. The projected image 
is shape conforming and it looks good from any view position. Important for VR context, we can of course apply view dependent warp to hide the geometry of the surface in user's perception from a specific view position. For example, here you can see the projected grid warp in a view dependent manner. The grid looks distorted from the wrong viewing position and the user cannot perceive the surface elevation from the correct view position. Here is our result by projecting on a cylindrical surface. Can you guess the number of projectors used in this setup? This is made by 10 tiled projectors. Here we use 6 projectors on a sand pit. We show the accuracy of the 3D reconstruction by projecting on a heat map on the surface showing the elevation of the surface. Finally, the result of projecting on a dome using 3 projectors. The projected 1 pixel wide grid shows the accuracy of geometric registration. Here you can see our result by projecting on a base using 6 projectors in a shape conforming manner. Notice how the grid image is conformed with the shape of the base. This table shows the comparison of our projector calibration result with the result of calibrating projectors one by one by traditional method of manually using a checkerboard. But note, since there is no consistency checks between the projector geometric registration using such independent per projector calibration of intrinsic and extrinsic of the devices cannot yield an accurate geometric registration. A consistent calibration as is offered by our method is critical to provide accurate geometric registration and therefore a high resolution seamless display. Finally, here you can see our result of recalibrating in change of any changes in the system, for example, changing the position and orientation of the one of the projectors. As you can see here, the system can quickly uh, detect the uh, movement and recalibrate the system. In conclusion, we present the first work on auto-calibrating projectors on arbitrary 3D shapes even in the presence of nonlinear distortions as it, is, as it is common in today's comedy projectors. Our system is accurate, robust, and scalable to any number of projectors and cameras. We accurately reconstruct the shape of the display surface without having at least two observing cameras at each point. Auto-calibration allows for quick recalibration in the face of changes in the projector position and orientation. However, our method achieves only edge blending, which often do not provide com complete uh, color seamlessness. Our future work in, is uh, on designing more sophisticated color calibration methods for such systems. Finally, we cannot address colored surfaces yet, which is also one of the future directions of re our research we would like to pursue. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much um, for uh, your presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do have some questions here um, that I, I could probably read, but unfortunately, we do not have the presenter and any author here uh, with us on the Zoom uh, meeting. Um, and I believe I, I cannot answer your questions either. So I will be happy to redirect them towards the um, chat rooms or the Slack channel or the um, hubs rooms, maybe. Um, and that concludes the this session. And um, I wish you a nice lunch or whatever time zone you're in. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the speakers and presenters and their excellent work.